On the subject of design, we thought we'd go over a couple of the more technical specs of the house just so you can have a better idea of what we've ended up with here. So we're on a 20 foot long by eight and a half foot wide uh, specialty trailer made by Iron Eagle. And that was one of the things that we didn't hold back on spending on. Not that the base price was particularly high, but because we're in Canada, we had a lot of extra expenses to get it here because Iron Eagle is located in uh, Oregon. So there was expenses with a trip to go pick it up. There was uh, importation fees and like exchange rate and some taxes and stuff. So our final cost was fairly high, but um, we definitely knew we wanted to start with something solid that we could trust that was fresh and new. Uh, rather than trying to clean up or modify some existing used trailer, uh, especially with that being the very first task that would need to be done. We didn't want to get bogged down with that. We wanted something nice, a uh, solid foundation to start on. And the other thing I'll point out about it is the dual axles are rated for 10,000 pounds combined. So we had to account for the weight of the trailer and then also be mindful of the weight of all the materials as we were building so that we never go over that rating. We found actually that there's a lot of room to work with, like we weren't in danger and had to skimp on things to, to stay below the weight. But like I said, definitely something we wanted to be mindful of the whole process. All the windows are tempered glass. There's nine of them and they all open except for this little one. The ones at the toilet room and the shower on the other side are sliders and they're up high so that you have a window in there but there's privacy obviously because you can't see in and then the ones on the ends are awnings that open this way so that even if it's raining we can keep those windows open and have airflow that crosses uh, the whole length of the house and then the ones on like the face and on the back are casements so when the weather is hotter and we want even more ventilation we can just crank those wide open We've got a pretty standard metal roof and we've built an awning over the front door to protect us from the large amounts of rain that we get in BC Canada. And we've even put together a sort of makeshift gutter that we might improve in the future. But we found that we needed it because of the uh, amount of rain and the way that we've designed it uh, with the slope of the roof and everything was causing tons of rainwater to just splash all over the front of the house. So this is an example of something that's very specific to our climate. There's multiple things that we've chosen, like different building methods, to make sure that our build was suitable for our climate. Another example being the way we did our siding. It's stood off with a rain screen in behind that's a ventilated, like a special ventilated strip. Uh, to allow air to pass through to dry out any water that may find its way behind there. And we did a similar gap uh, underneath the roof sheathing and then also between the sheathing and the roofing itself. All these different layers to try to deal with the rain that we knew the structure would be subjected to. So something that I think might be often overlooked, at least at first, is whether or not a particular tiny house design would be suitable for uh, a different climate, like if it ended up in a different geographical location. Our house has two by four walls and with the rock wool insulation, we only get about an R14 value, which is relatively low, but because of our mild climate, it's, it's perfectly fine here, but it wouldn't be very appropriate for let's say Alaska or uh, somewhere out in Eastern Canada. Likewise, it probably wouldn't be suitable for somewhere like Florida because we don't have any cooling built into the house because it never gets uh, hot enough here to merit that. And using Florida as an example, down there where you have hot humid air outside and you're trying to cool the inside of your house, that could affect where you place your vapor barrier because the source of moisture is coming from outside instead of within. So there's all these details that need to be accounted for when deciding which building methods are going to be applied to your tiny house. If it's known where a tiny house is going to end up, or at least roughly what coast or uh, you know north or south, then the methods used can uh, optimize for that location. But if a tiny house is being built specifically to allow for a more nomadic lifestyle, then a bunch of different building methods would need to be combined to account for all the different climates that it could encounter. 
So in that case, you'd be going for a more generalized approach, whereas in our case, we were able to specialize, allowing us to ignore certain building practices that were irrelevant while focusing and maximizing the ones that are relevant to us. We've got a utility box where we house our propane tanks. We've got two 30-pound tanks in there. And when we were trying to decide between electrical and propane, we decided to go for a split of both, putting the two highest energy consumers on propane. So that's our water heat and our like general heating, like space heat. That has a few advantages, one of which is that we could technically, if run off a battery, get our uh, heat and hot water, uh, even if there was like a power outage or we were disconnected from the grid for some reason. And it also allowed us to keep our electrical service down. It's still fairly big because we have a lot of electronics and of course our cooking is uh, electrical, not propane. Um, but even more reason to have them split rather than having a massive electrical service to do everything or a ton of propane, like if we had propane cooking as well, uh, we'd be going through the, the tanks way too often. A big concern for us and something that played into a lot of decisions was humidity and moisture inside such a small space. And it also ties in somewhat to our climate because uh, it can be fairly humid here, raining all the time and everything. It was one of the reasons we made our first choice against propane, which was for cooking, because when propane burns, moisture is given off. So if you have an open flame, say at your stove for cooking, that's putting a whole bunch of moisture into the air. So the propane appliances that we chose, the furnace and the water heater, are both RV appliances. And that's beneficial because they suck in the air to feed the flame from outside, so it's not using up our precious oxygen inside, and then it also expels the exhaust from the flame straight out with all that moisture. It's just the transfer of heat that actually happens inside. Everything to do with the burning is all exterior. The last couple of sort of technical things I'll point out are that it's not functional yet, but we're gonna have a system that brings in fresh air and expels stale air just to keep it fresh inside. Uh, and then we also have water coming in, which is just like a potable water hose coming off of the well on the property that we're on. And we've also got sort of a temporary uh, gray water disposal system that's just using a garden hose right now. But after we move the house to a different spot on the property, we're hoping to just drain it directly into a swale. And if I haven't mentioned it already, uh, we have a composting toilet, so uh, and we use all biodegradable like soaps and, and whatnot, so it's just gray water that we have to deal with. Thanks for watching. Subscribe if you like what we're doing here and turn on email notifications so you never miss a video. You can also find extra resources in the description below. We spend countless hours making these videos for YouTube. So if you appreciate our work, take three minutes to watch the video in the top left tile to learn some ways that you can support us for free. We'd really appreciate it.